to all brothers and sisters. Uh, Happy New Year for all of you, for all of us. Welcome to this session of our convention. Before the session begins, I would like to make some announcements about the stalls that are located near the main entrance, just in the left side of the main entrance. You have information in your information booklet on the page nine in case you want to go through. But the, we have some stalls. Uh, first of those stalls is the Indian section book stall, where you can buy books printed by Indian section of Theosophical Society. Then you have the Shoba travel desk. There you can book uh, any transportation you need, auto, taxi, plane, train, whatever you need, you can book there. Uh, wool includes stall. The, it is not yet there due to some problems, but we hope that today we can have it there. In case you need to buy some woolen clothes outside, very near to the campus, there are some um, woolen clothes uh, shops, so you can go there. Uh, there is also the Lalman laundry stall. Uh, which you, where you can take your clothes to be washed and dry and whatever service you need and pay the, the service. And the shoe polish stall that is complimentary. Uh, we have also an, a stall of books by our Indian section theosophical member, Sri Lakshman Rao. He, there you can find some theosophical books in case you are interested to buy. Uh, there will be also the KFI stall and the Mangal fruit stall. In the KFI stall, you can buy books from Jiddu Krishnamurti and also some uh, things made by the people of the Krishnamurti Foundation. And uh, the tea stall is also available behind the administrative building. And also, uh, we want to remember that two rickshaws are available for transportation. They are complementary within the campus. So you can go from one place to another making use of the rituals. And today, from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., uh, there will be a, a money exchange in the inquiry office in case you need to change some money. Uh, so I remember the stalls are located at the left of the main entrance, and due to call, it will begin at 11 until 5 o'clock. Okay? Welcome, and again, Happy New Year for all. Please rise for the universal prayer. Repeat after me. O oh, hidden life, vibrant in every atom. O oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. O oh, hidden love, embracing all in oneness. May each who feels himself as one with thee Know he is also one with every other. Please be seated. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters, on this cold morning in the holy city of Varanasi. It is my pleasure today to introduce two speakers who have been long-term and very committed members of the Theosophical Society. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Mr. John Vorstermund from New Zealand. He is the National President 
of the New Zealand section of the Theosophical Society and a former president of the Indo-Pacific Federation of the TS. John works as a natural health educator with a diploma in Ayurvedic medicine and is also an internet communication specialist. He has visited the international convention several times and has contributed in different ways by giving talks, being involved in panel discussions and questions and answer sessions and many other things as well. His work has been widely appreciated in many theosophical circles. The title of his short lecture today will be Awakening the Heart Mind, which sounds like an intriguing topic. So please welcome John. Thank you, Gerard, and um, good morning to you all, this being the first morning of 2020. So one of the things I would like to consider as part of this presentation is the, um, the new mission statement of the Theosophical Society which is to serve humanity by cultivating an ever deeper understanding and realization of the ageless wisdom, spiritual self-transformation, and the unity of all life. So what I'm talking about in this session is under the mission statement. It also focuses on the theme of the convention, nurturing the, the divine seed. Have you considered what the divine seed actually is? So perhaps I'll answer some of these questions through this presentation. I have to turn the lights off, but I'm going to cover really two main areas here. What is the heart and mind? And some, per some perspectives on awakening the heart and mind. So first I'd like to spend a few moments looking at what the heart and mind is. Well, what is our soul? So the, we know from our theosophical perspectives that there's, the mind has two aspects. The first is related to our human nature and the other is related to our soul or more divine nature. So the human part of our nature is made up of the, the physical body, the pranic, field, the energy field, the astral double, and the mind which is linked to our passions, our desires, and our attachments. And it's often represented as a square. So this part of our nature, Blavatsky and the Mahatmas call our animal nature. So really, we are living inside a vehicle which is, is strongly, has a strong animal nature. The other part of us is the, is the soul. And the soul is made up of the mind which is linked to our buddhic nature, our intuitive nature, and our atmic, which is commonly called our spiritual nature or our true self, that which we all share and all have in common. And it's often represented by a triangle. 
So in the context of this presentation, when I speak of soul, I'm speaking of that higher triad, that pyramid. And when I'm speaking of the human nature or the human mind, I'm speaking of that lower, that lower square. In the voice of the silence, in the two paths, draws our attention to the difference between the way of the eye and the way of the heart. In fact, it, to quote it, it says, the Dharma of the heart is the embodiment of Bodhi, the permanent and everlasting. Here the term Bodhi means true divine self. The Dharma of the heart is the embodiment of the eternal or the external, the non-existing. So it's interesting just to f reflect on those two statements. So is the I reflects the nature of the outward turned mind. While the heart represents the mind which is turned inward. And in the context I'm talking about here, the inward turned mind is a mind which is focused in that triangle we call the soul. The outward turned mind is the mind that is very reflective of the mind in our animal nature, the human mind. At this stage of human evolution in general, our attention or awareness is focused in that very human mind. We often call it the lower mind. The challenge is to move our intention from the lower mind into the higher mind. That's part of our journey today, of everyone's journey today. Some of us do this consciously, and others aren't aware of this, so they're almost trapped in that human nature. I have an interesting quote from Krishnamurti here, which was interesting watching his video last night. Um, and he says, when the heart enters the mind, the mind has quite a different quality. It is really then limitless, not only in capacity to think, to act efficiently, but also in its sense of living in a vast separate or a vast space where you're a part of everything. The point that I find most interesting here is when he says, when the heart enters the mind, which from the perspective that I'm talking about here is when the soul enters the lower mind or the, the higher nature enters into the mind. Now, often when we try and meditate, we find ourselves trying to move our lower mind into the higher but essentially, I don't believe it works that way. The way I believe it works at this point in time is that once that lower mind is still and quiet, then automatically the heart that Krishnamurti talks about 
moves in and takes the place of the, the lower mind. It's not about destroying or negating the lower mind, but it's about it being overshadowed by the heart, the higher self. It's, it's worth spending some time reflecting on anything Krishnamurti says, I find. <clears throat> so, to be able to see what is true and real, we need to develop some sort of mechanism by which we know what is true and not true. And this, this is what we refer to as discrimination. So discrimination itself is a journey. And the important part of the, the process of disc discrimination is looking at yourself. Like we can spend a lot of time looking outwards and trying to decide the external world, what is false, or what is more true, and so on. It becomes very difficult to know what is true and what is not true, unless first of all, we have discovered for ourselves, within ourselves, what is true and what is not true. For example, anyone who spent any time meditating or reflecting knows that all sorts of thoughts and ideas present themselves in our mind. So have you ever noticed that when you try and meditate that your focus is distracted by these thoughts? The question I have is, where do those thoughts come from? I know that the thoughts I have are different from everybody else's thoughts here. The thoughts you all have are unique. Why are they different from other people's thoughts? Have you thought of that? Where do our thoughts come from? The only way you're going to find the answer to, is to this is to examine those thoughts. Write the thoughts down. You'll find that most of the thoughts that travel through your mind are quite similar. And if you reflect on it, you'll find that those thoughts are patterns that you've created in your life. They're patterns or habitual types of thinking that you have. So when someone presents you with some ideas or some thoughts, the first thing that comes up in your mind is your patterns of perception, your patterns of thinking. So immediately you judge what has been said based upon those patterns that have developed in your mind. And you tend, <coughs> I'm talking generally here, but we tend then to judge what's being said based upon those patterns. They have different names. Some people call it personal conditioning, cultural conditioning, memory, it has all sorts of names. So really the, the most important part of moving from the mind to the heart is the first step is being aware of your patterns, your ways of thinking. Until you understand those, it is very hard for you to perceive anything else. One of the 
interesting things as part of my theosophical journey was in the study of comparative religion. I spent a lot of time studying some of the major religions. And through that study, and spending time reflecting on that study, you come across what is it, some of the very important values or hallmarks of all the religions. Today when we look at religions, religions are today are a reflection of the true religion. So every religion holds some truth that came from the true religion, which is often what we call the divine wisdom. And one of the most common things that you'll find is in virtually all the major religions is the importance of the respect for life. Now in Eastern religions it's often called ahimsa. And my translation of it is respect for life, honoring of life. And simply to understand that concept that idea, and then try and put it into action in your own life, takes you on a journey of its own. So what does respect for life say to you? Like you can read lots of texts you know, in Buddhism, in the Eightfold Path, there's you know, different ways to look at respect for life, like right livelihood and so forth. So how does your job relate to this whole idea of respect for life? You know? In the Yoga Sutras, the first of the Yamas is Ahimsa, respect for all life. You, know, you find it everywhere. In, in Jain, it's the most important quality to develop. You know, it, the Jain take this respect for life to such a strong degree that they will even, when they go to bed at night, they first of all sweep the bed that they lie on to make sure there's no insects lying there. Then before they turn over in their sleep at night, they'll gently brush the bed to make sure they don't kill any insects. So they've taken it to the nth degree. Now, whether that's what you perceive as respect for life or not is something that you have to decide as part of your journey. These are the sort of qualities that we need to develop as part of that spiritual journey, part of the opening of the heart. I don't know if any of you saw The Matrix, the film that was out. It's about 20 years old now. It, it, it's really the film, the film generally is depicting a world where someone suddenly finds things strange in this world. He has, this person has a wake up call a bit like many of us here. You know, we've had a wake-up call at some point in our life. As part of that wake-up call, this person realizes that the world he is living in is not real. And eventually, he finds that he wakes up from a dream he has been living. A dream that every, all the characters in this movie have been living. And he wakes up to see all these people sleeping. The stream, which is what they all perceive as reality. But he wakes up to find that this isn't reality at all. This is an illusion. The whole film is an analogy of the life that we're living. The life that we're living is, in a sense, a dream that 
we perceive as real. And if we are willing to look at, at this and wake up from the dream, where will we find ourselves? You know, some people say we'll find ourselves in another dream. But maybe you'll find yourself at home in your true self. So we're all really pilgrims on a pilgrimage journey. One that never, never ends. You look at modern pilgrimage journeys are very good examples of explaining what this journey we're on is about. One of the one of the, the, the pilgrimage journeys that I found very good to read was Puello Coelho's The Pilgrimage, which was the story of Puello Coelho, who was a Brazilian. He had undergone some sort of initiation ceremony, but he didn't pass the initiation. All the initiates were given a sword, and he didn't get his sword. So he was a bit disappointed, to put it mildly. And after the ceremony, he went up to his teacher and says, well, why didn't I get my sword? And the teacher or his mentor said, well, you're not ready for it yet. Well, what do I have to do then? Now, it's interesting. One thing, we always want someone to tell us what we have to do. And have you ever noticed that nobody can really tell you what to do? that you've got to do it, find out how to do it for yourself. Krishnamurti made this quite apparent in the movie last night. He, he pointed out that we're always looking for someone to tell us what to do, whether it's a, a guru, you know, some sort of master, some sort of mentor. We're always looking for the answer from somebody else but no one can give you the answer. The same as in meditation. We're always asking someone to teach us how to meditate or what we have to do to meditate. But the reality is we have to find that ourselves. That's part of the meditation process. The inner journey is not the same for everybody. And to put it in a book and say this is what it is, doesn't work. So Paul, Paul, Paul Quello went on his pilgrimage. On the, his teacher told him to get a sword. He had to go on a journey of the um, of the um, of the the trail across northern Spain, which is called the. Hang on, it's here somewhere. The Camino Trail, thank you. And he, he said, his mentor said, the sword will be waiting for you at the end of the journey. So he started off this journey, as we all do in life, we start off this journey having a goal to get to. So for Paolo, the goal was to get to that end of that journey as fast as he could to get his sword. So off he went, he had a guide. No, he didn't want a guide. The guide was only going to slow him down. So he told the guide to go away. <coughs> and then after three days, he found he was going around in circles. So you know, his lesson there was that you know, a guide can't be useful to point the way. Or at least Google Maps would have been useful, I suppose. But the, and then all the way along his journey, he was slowed down or stopped by events that happened along the way. You know, he's, he got very frustrated, very annoyed about these events. He, he got very angry. But, if, and this is a long journey, this journey. It takes 30 to 40 days to walk the Camino Trail, if you do the whole, whole trail. But eventually he realized that each, 
of these events that he came across and slowed him down along the way had something that were teaching him something he had to learn about himself. So I won't go into the whole story because you can read the book. It's called The Pilgrimage. But he realized that the sword wasn't important. What was important was being aware of what's happening to us at every point in our journey. So it's a way of looking and understanding ourselves. It's a way of understanding our human nature and the way of learning. So once again, you're not going to find the answers that you want through reading your books, through studying materials, to going to different workshops, or even you know, going to gurus. You're not going to find the answers that you want. The answers that you want present themselves as part of your journey. So the journey itself is the important thing. Look at the journey you want. Look at everything. So to, so to summarize, to awaken the heart requires that you first look at yourself, that you unravel the nature that you've developed, the habitual thought patterns, the beliefs that may be inaccurate. Examine them, whether they are true or not true. And this is a continuing process, your whole life, maybe several lives. For me, probably many, many lives. It takes a long time. And the second part is to look at your life as a journey of learning, that every step in that journey teaches you something which you're going to need for the next step. And through that process, your awareness grows, your understanding grows, and you get to learn who you are. And eventually, that lower mind, that intellectual mind, loses its control over you. And the heart, as Krishnamurti talks about, then slips into the mind. And your whole perception of reality completely change. It is then, as he says, or as he says, that the unity of life becomes a reality. So I thank you, everybody. I hope I've given you some thoughts to reflect on. And I just hope that, you know, I wish you a 2020 where your heart may enter your mind. So thank you. So thanks, John, for a thoroughly engaging and thought-provoking talk there. I think you will agree he certainly made us aware of the importance of, of the mind, but particularly the heart as well, which we sometimes forget. So thank you very much for that. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Mr. Pedro Oliveira, who is originally from Brazil, but now resides in Australia. Pedro Oliveira joined the Theosophical Society in 1978 and holds a degree in philosophy from the Federal University in Brazil. At present, he is the education coordinator for the Australian section. Pedro has lectured widely for the society in many countries and his articles have appeared in a number of TS journals. Positions previously held by him include 
the International Secretary of the TS, Head of the Editorial Office at the International Headquarters in Adyar, and President of the Indo-Pacific Federation of the TS. Pedro is also the author of the book, En Sri Ram, A Life of Beneficence and Wisdom, published by TPH Adyar in 2009. And of interest, the title of his forthcoming book to be released this year is Annie Besant in India, which I'm sure we'll all look forward to reading. The title of his talk today is Those Other Divine Fragments Which Are Struggling Side by Side, which certainly sounds like a fascinating title. So please welcome Pedro. Thank you, Jared. I would like to invite you respectfully to spend a moment reflecting how fortunate we are here to be here together as members of the Theosophical Society on the very first day of the new decade. Our love for theosophy and the work of the TS has brought us here and also those who are watching this session to the live streaming. There, are, there is much turmoil in the world, but we have been given this opportunity of being together in this many times blessed city of Kashi. So this is really a, a special time for all of us during this convention. The Sanskrit word sadhana implies, according to the Monier Williams Sanskrit Dictionary, leading straight to a goal, guiding well, furthering, effective, efficient, productive of accomplishment and performance. It is usually translated as spiritual practice. However, the so-called modern mind has made of it a veritable supermarket. Not only there are many practices on offer, most of which involve some kind of payment, but there is also a subtle competition between them, as if a particular teacher whose spiritual brand, so to speak, was more famous, would perhaps attract more followers. One of the most bizarre features of the modern world is to see so-called gurus and spiritual teachers building an enormous publicity machine around them. Contrast this with the life of utter self-effacement lived by Sri Ramana Maharshi, for example, and you will realize the difference between spiritual integrity and sham. Besides what was described above, some people tend to view spiritual practices as if they were commodities for their pleasure and satisfaction. For example, there may be those who enroll in a meditation course do not achieve results in the short term as they expected and proceed to search for another practice. This may be one of the reasons why Krishnaji said that no practices can lead one to truth. A another question that also arises, given that Krishnaji used to meditate when he was a young man, what kind of mind do we bring to a spiritual practice? If a superficial mind approaches it, then it becomes just an exercise in self-delusion. Perhaps the noblest example of the right attitude in this regard was given by the Buddha himself. It only took him one meeting with a beggar on the roadside to build in him an unmovable determination to find the truth about suffering. 
Carlos Castaneda's teacher, Don Juan Matos, had this to say about traveling on a path. Quote, for me, there is only the traveling on paths that have heart, on any path that may have heart, and the only worthwhile challenge is to traverse its full length. And there I travel, looking, looking, breathlessly. The book, Light on the Path, which was originally published in 1885, is one of the theosophical gems. It is considered a theosophical gem because it contains essential teachings for us to meditate and ponder. But some of its aphorisms are quite challenging. Rule 17 of Light on the Path says it, it, it encourages us to seek out the way, implying that it remains undiscovered in the midst of a life governed by self-centeredness. We can find, in other words, we can find many things in life, but not necessarily the inward path, the inward way towards self-transformation. This involves the paradox of getting out of oneself and at the same time looking at oneself objectively. I had the great fortune during my visit to Sri Lanka several years ago of meeting a senior monk and I asked him, I said in the West there is a great deal of excitement about vipassana meditation. I said, what is your definition of vipassana? And he said to me, vipassana is looking at oneself intelligently. When, when we look at ourselves intelligently, there is no self, therefore there is no problem. When we look at ourselves unintelligently, there is a self, and therefore there are problems. Light on the Path also mentions the divine fragments, that we should regard the divine fragments that are struggling with us, around us. That means people we meet, not only family members, friends, but even people whom we are not, never going to meet physically. They are also part of this journey, this evolutionary journey. The Oxford Dictionary gives us the meaning of the word fragment a small part broken off or separated from something, an isolated or incomplete part of something. It's only when we look at ourselves intelligently that we discover that our sense of self is incomplete, for such a sense amounts to isolation, separation from others. As fragments, we fail to know the truth of our own being. When that truth is found, then there are no others, only the oneself, Atman, indivisible consciousness. But to pretend that we have reached that state is a form of dangerous delusion. I remember watching a video from, the, uh, uh, from one of the institutions which was founded under the guidance of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Colorado, the Dalai Lama said to the audience, he had a friend, a Western friend, who visited India and traveled through India so many times, then came to the Ramsala and said to the Dalai Lama, I have developed the power to read human minds, and I want to read yours. The Dalai Lama, as a wise person, agreed. Then when this gentleman disclosed what was the content of the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama said, wrong. And, and then the Dalai Lama said to, to the audience, this is the danger, the danger of, of allowing this kind of power or eagerness to go up to one's head. The way suggested in light on the path is truly to be found in one's living in how we approach daily contacts, relationships, and choices. The implication is that the way is a perception transformed by other-centeredness. 
instead of self-centeredness, by welcoming others into our existence and not by shutting them out. As Radhaji once said, universal brotherhood is a mind without barriers. I would say without walls as well. What such a mind sees is the very truth that all life is one. To live a spiritual life can be, can be seen as carefully building a vessel into which the newness of life can be poured. That means having no demands, no expectations, no projections. If the right work is done, the blessedness will come, but it cannot come at all into a consciousness in which the illusion of self is still alive. The Voice of the Silence, another theosophical gem, published originally in 1889 in, in its fragment three, illustrates the fact that the struggle against the sense of self is not, to, it's not for the faint-hearted. Some passages of the for Voice of the Silence are really graphic, not PG. This is the passage. The fearless warrior, his precious life blood oozing from his wide and gaping wounds, will still attack the foe, drive him from out his stronghold, vanquish him he, before he himself expires. Act then, all ye who fail and suffer, act like him, and from the stronghold of your soul, chase all your foes away, ambition, anger, hatred, even the shadow of desire, when even you have failed. So it's a very simple exercise. All we have to do is to drive away from our consciousness forever ambition, anger, hatred, and even the shadow of desire. Then, from fragments we become an integral part of humanity, of the wholeness of life. Such realization has depths that cannot be fully fathomed. It transforms the world. <coughs> Every great spiritual teacher has inundated human consciousness with powerful streams of wisdom, compassion, love, and forgiveness. Ac according to the occult teachings, humanity would not be here if it was not for them. But there is a limit to what they can do under the reign of karma. We must do our part. So let us try briefly and consider some of the contents of Rule 20 of Light on the Path. It says, seek it, that means the path, <coughs> seek it not by one road. To each temperament there is one road which seems the most desirable, but the way is not found by devotion alone, by religious contemplation alone, by ardent progress, by self-sacrificing labor, by studious observation of, nat of life. None alone can take the disciple more than one step forward. When we identify ourselves with only one perspective, our view tends to become lopsided. Madame Blavatsky predicted that if the Theosophical Society made of Theosophy a very fundamentalistic, hard and fast ideology, the society would die in a sandbank. Dissent, for example, was stifled in Europe for 11 centuries by the brutal domination of the Roman Catholic theology over secular learning, and it took the cruel and inhumane sacrifice of Giordano Bruno's life for free thought to dawn in Europe. The above mentioned rule also shows that the way to the infinite light cannot be a mere technique, something that we simply apply in the hope of making progress. As mentioned in the Voice of the Silence fragment three now, the seeds of wisdom cannot sprout and grow in airless space. To live and reap experience, the mind needs breath and depth 
and points to draw it towards the diamond soul. Seek not those points in Maya's realm, but soar be beyond illusions, search the eternal and the changeless sat, that means truth. Mistrust is fancy's false suggestion. These are wise instructions indeed, for they show that although experiences come to all of us, it is only that mind that has breadth and depth that can transform experiences into real learning instead of getting enmeshed in them. The wise mind receives every experience as a teacher instead of an agent of satisfaction and suffering. For the immature mind, experiences are always a struggle between the like and the doesn't like, implying that the self or the ego sense acts like an unwise self-appointed judge of whatever life brings to us. The tragedy is that this mechanism of unawareness may go on for many lives until the blows of karma shatter it. Light on the path continues. All steps are necessary to make up the ladder. The vices of man become steps in the ladder one by one, as they are surmounted. The virtues of man are steps indeed, necessary, not by any means to be dispensed with. Yet, though they create a fair atmosphere and a happy future, they are useless if they stand alone. The whole nature of man must be used wisely by the one who desires to enter the way. The Christian tradition provides stunning examples of saints who had a distinctly immoral past. What I'm going to say is not any secret. San, San, Saint Augustine confessed it. Saint Augustine, for example, included the following in his confessions. As a youth, I prayed, give me chastity and continence, but not right now. In spite of their moral weaknesses, such saints seem to have the capacity to tread the path by overcoming them. However, overcoming vices and practicing virtues according to light on the path is not sufficient. Only wisdom can properly deal with weaknesses and make a virtue a stepping stone toward self-transformation and not to a road of self-righteousness. There is a, a very sober um, statistics from Madame Blavatsky, published on, in the magazine The Path, uh, edited by William Kwan Judge, 1886, August. She said, out of 72 people admitted under protest by the masters as jealous, only three didn't fail and only one succeeded. The speculation is out that this one was called Damodar Mavlankar. The Rule 20 continues, each man is to himself absolutely the way, the truth, and the life, but he is only so when he grasps his whole individuality firmly and by the force of his awakened will, recognizes this individuality not as himself, but, a, but as that thing which he has with pain created for his own use, by means of which he purposes, as his growth slowly develops his intelligence, to reach the life beyond individuality. When he knows that for his this wonderful complex separated life exists, then indeed, and then only, he is upon the way. The word individual is a very interesting one. It comes from the Latin individuus, meaning indivisible. For Dr. Carl Gustav Jung, we are not truly individuals yet, as our lives are heavily influenced by what he called the collective unconscious. The resurgence of racism in different parts of the world corrupt today corroborates his view, and I mean in different parts of the world. 
in my own country, they have identified 300 Nazi cells. By, by that I mean Brazil, not Australia. The resurgence of, oh, sorry, the road to individuality, according to Jung, is not an easy one as it involves confronting and integrating our shadow side, those aspects of ourselves we refuse to look at, like anger, ill will, and the tendency to dominate. Rule 20 makes the remarkable statement that the sense of individuality was created by ourselves so that in the course of our evolution, we may reach the life beyond individuality. In other words, the sense of individuality is not an end in itself, but a, a scaffolding to help us reach that truly undivided life that lies beyond manas, or mind, our potent co cognitive principle the center of awareness and intellectual activity. In theosophy, that life beyond the individuality is buddhi, an unmediated understanding that the entire existence is one, a life-transforming realization that to work for oneself is to work for disappointment. The rule continues. Seek it by plunging into the mysterious and glorious depths of your own inmost being. Seek it by testing all experience, by utilizing the senses in order to understand the growth and meaning of individuality and the beauty and obscurity of those other divine fragments which are struggling side by side with you and form the race to which you belong. Seek it by study of the laws of being, the laws of nature, the laws of the supernatural, and seek it by making the profound obeisance of the soul to the dim star that burns within. Steadily, as you watch and worship, its light will grow stronger. Then you may know you have found the beginning of the way, and when you have found the end, its light will suddenly become infinite light. In its final part, Rule 20 of Light on the Path describes the depths that can be entered by, into by someone who underwent the right preparation. Here, the spiritual practice acquires a dimension of profound discovery of what a human being is meant to be when he or she leaves behind a worldly mind completely dominated by self-centeredness. Consciousness has become extraordinarily sensitive purified from the dross of selfishness and pride, ready to understand all that lives and approaching our every relationship as the nearness to the sacred. The teaching contained in this rule does not come from an ordinary mind. It comes from a consciousness that has reached the swarupa of life. That means life in its essential nature divine, sacred, one, eternal. How does one plunge into the mysterious and glorious depths of one's inmost being? The first step may be listening, by listening to the contents of the personal mind. Each one of the <coughs> Each one of such contents, emotions, thoughts, memories, and reactions, is claiming the attention of the perceiver. And yet, the moment the searchlight of awareness and attention is shown on them, they dissolve. This opens the door for experiencing a new depth in oneself. The deeper the experience, the lesser is the feeling of self-importance. And the reverse is equally true the more shallow the experience, sorry, the greater and more pronounced is the feeling of self-importance. Gerard, can I have a, my water bottle, if that's possible? I will deduct the de lecture time accordingly.
The deeper the experience, the lesser is the feeling of self-importance. And the reverse is equally true. The more shallow the experience, the greater, more pronounces the feeling of self-importance. When perception matures into spiritual perception, there is not an ego to be advertised, protect, or promote. <coughs> the core of our individuality is manas, the mind principle, the coordinating center for all experiences, and the theater for the great evolutionary drama in each human being. HPB said that manas is dual in its nature. Part of it expresses a strong pull and attraction towards desire, karma, and creates what she called the desire mind. Desire is not just a recurrent focal point. Desire is present in every aspect, <coughs> in every aspect of the activity of the mind, even at the subtle levels. The Buddhist tradition holds that one of the fetters that prevent the disciple to move towards the stage of our heart, for example, is conceit. Extraordinary alertness, extraordinary, extraordinary alertness needs to be exercised towards the very end of the path, for desire may lay hidden in every nook and corner of the mind. Next, Rule 20 mentions the need for us to understand the beauty and obscurity of those other divine fragments which are struggling side by side with you and form the race to which you belong. The personal mind tends to react to every contact, as was said before, <coughs> sorry, through a, a pattern of likes and dislikes. Under dislikes lies hidden indifference an attitude towards others as if they d did not matter. Indifference may lead to callousness, which adds much more somber dimension to the self-centeredness in us. <coughs> the teaching concludes with an exhortation for us to make profound obeisance of the soul to the dim star that burns within. It implies a faint perception of a much deeper dimension within us. Some mystics suggest that this perception may lead to an unknowing. That means going beyond everything known by the personal mind. The rule also mentions the words watch and worship, indicating that this is not a merely intellectual exercise, it is a preparation to meet the sacred. <coughs> we are told that the end of the way is lost in infinite light. And the final secret is revealed. That infinite light is not only our destination, it is who we are. It is also who all those around us are. We were all along fragments of the divine, now made whole again. Well, thanks, Pedro, for your very engaging and very, very food for thought, which we can here, and this session is now closed. <laughs>